Hello, everybody. Aloha. Well, we have the Sunday sitters with us today on the joining the retreat. We're on the Modito weekend, about to start a week of the rest of the week, the third week of the month retreat. So it's a nice gathering of all of us today. Thank you. Mudita. So if you want to take the time and see everyone joining, connecting. Hmm. Aloha. <laughs> hey, it's so good to see you. So um, I'm going to begin this afternoon talking about mudita in the context of the four Brahma Viharas. And uh, how it applies to our practice, and our, our daily lives, and the so-called uh, near and far enemies. That is a near enemy being like um, something like mudita, something like the Brahma Vihara, but not exactly the Brahma Vihara, um, a, a, a counterfeit or a masquerade that we mistake for the Brahma Vihara. And the far enemy being um, the opposite, opposite force of loving kindness or compassion empathetic joy and equanimity. I'm going to start with this translation from the, the same German monk who spent his life in Sri Lanka uh, 60, 60 or 70 years of it and passed away at 95 that I mentioned the other day. Nyanapanakatera, I think he, I believe he produced the first uh, quite complete book on the four foundations of mindfulness in which he gave a lot of credit to the Mahasi tradition, uh, the lineage that, that we trained in and that we present and that is widely presented by the Western teachers. He gave credit to the... Um, the monk U Narada, uh, in the late 1800s, he, U Narada searched for the source of how to, how to practice the four foundations of mindfulness. 
uh, and it said he finally found uh, an awakened hermit in a cave in the Sagain Hills, uh, who's, who said to him very briefly, well, you be mindful of the body in the body, and you be mindful of feelings within the feelings, and you be mindful of the mind heart within the mind heart, and you be mindful of phenomena within the phenomena, like within the six sense doors. And so he went off and practiced and said to have become enlightened. And he is, he was the teacher of Mahasi Sayadaw, who was Upandita's teacher. So Nyanapanika trans, translated from an earlier monk. Um, and he, he, he writes, the awakened one, Lord Buddha said, here, O oh bhikkhus, bhikkhus, anyone who practices meditation, a disciple lets her mind pervade one quarter of the world with thoughts of unselfish joy. And so the second, and so the third, and so the fourth quarter of the world. And thus the whole world, above, below, around, everywhere and equally, she continues to pervade with a heart of unselfish joy, abundant, grown great, measureless, without hostility or ill will. That's the instruction. Those were the early instructions of how to do this practice. We usually just quote from the early text, the Buddha said, call up metta Brahma Vihara, abide in that Brahma Vihara. This is just a little longer version of the same thing. <clears throat> and it points to uh, a question that came up in the question and answer earlier today. It's pointedly stated that this kind of joy is a, is a selfless joy not a selfish joy, not one that's self-reference, not I or me or mine, but that unconditional joy. It's the joy that exudes joy, not I or me or mine. And it, it draws from an inner wellspring we all have of measureless joy. And in this translation from the Anapanika, it, it's mentioned, uh, abundant, grown great, measureless. So it points to actually one of the terms that define the Brahma Viharas, um, the immeasurables. The immeasurables because of their boundless, measureless nature. Uh, and that this ancient teaching that I just read um, implies directly that we all have this inner wellspring of these measureless qualities, these four Brahma Viharas. The first being metta in the first week, we, we began with the metta Brahma Vihara, or to be precise, the metta Brahma Vihara uh, Dhamma. And it's complete and very defined. Uh, if we understand metta as an unconditional love, a love without boundaries, without conditions, without anything needing to be the way we want it to be. Uh, and Brahma being a word that means either sublime or divine, or it's the word for the Brahma realm in the ancient Buddhist cosmology. So it in indicates a very subtle state. And all these Brahma Viharas that we're practicing, um, we practice because they're all aimed toward 
and, and gradually become more and more subtle qualities of the heart. And at that level of subtlety, just begins to pervade all of our being, sinking into our bodies, our bones, our neuronal system, our complete body-mind unified system. And therefore it influences uh, our thoughts and our speech and our actions, kind of nothing left out. Brahma Vihara, Vihara means dwelling or abode. So the abode of the sublime or abode of the divine. Um, the dwelling place, uh, when we abide, cultivating these, this measureless metta or karuna, and this weekend it's the mudita, selfless joy. So we're regarding it, even if we don't yet experience it, as this very subtle um, divine-like quality, sublime-like place of dwelling in the heart, the dwelling or abode, abode ultimately, of course, being our heart. So cultivating the Brahma Vihara, Dhamma it's the it's Dhamma in the sense of the whole body of teachings and this particular teaching body of teaching is the Brahma Vihara teaching. So the Mudita Brahma Vihara Dhamma we're choosing a particular quality that we know of because it was spoken about about from the ancients uh, within us that measureless wellspring of these subtle uh, qualities, Brahma, Viharas. Uh, they're also known as Kusala, which is also a, a very ethically subtle quality of heart, a goodness that one can hardly define. Earlier today, in talking about the mudita, uh, it, I mentioned that there's no adequate English translation. And we don't usually, we don't grow up hearing about mudita or feeling mudita for others. We're not taught to feel joy for others' accomplishments, success and happiness and goodness. We actually ironically use the word envy as a compliment. You've worked really hard to get where you are. I envy you. You know, and it's usually said in a joyful way, not in, a, not in the hostile definition of envy, which is actually one of the um, mudita's opposing forces, far enemies. So that's how, that's how loosely it's, it's uh, inculcated into our you know, education as we grow up. So as the Brahma Viharas are, are taught, there is a degree of subtlety from easier to, to more and more, um, more and more wisdom and therefore more and more subtlety. Metta being basic, ground of connection, feeling goodwill for others, for other beings, other living beings, and, and learning that we have this measureless and unconditional love by giving it out, by holding the image or felt sense of another being. We, often we start with a, a safe being, a worthy being, like a, a teacher, our grandparent, uh, or just some being that makes us feel so safe that we can continuously hold them and cultivate the loving kindness until it starts reciprocating and we start to feel it come back to ourselves. And so then we learn about the unselfish self-love, 
that we get filled with. And we do that with each, each one of these, so the Karuna practice or um, wise compassion is a little, is a little more subtle and then therefore often a little more challenging because we usually start the compassion practice uh, by calling up a being that's currently in some form of pain or difficulty or suffering. So that can be a little more challenging. Uh, and we often go back to the wellspring of metta, you know, as a refuge, as a source to reset. And, and then when the metta is strong, move again to the compassion until we, until we feel that it's actually a positive force. It's a pleasant, uh, compassion is always a pleasant feeling tone. Uh, and we learn what the near and far enemies of compassion are. So we know what compassion is and what it isn't until that's strong. And so mudita is even subtler. It's more refined, there's more wisdom involved. And, and for that reason, it's why it can easily escape us you know, as a culture. Um, we don't think of it, we're not taught it when we're really young in, in, this, in, our, in our Western countries. So the, the mudita, uh, Brahma Vihara, Dhamma, is also one of the immeasurables, also selfless. The Buddha borrowed, so to speak, these Brahma Viharas because they were already being practiced, but they weren't necessarily being practiced in a selfless way. One can get very deep in any of these Brahma Viharas as a concentration practice, but still have an attachment or identification with it and think that it is, it is us, me, mine, our heart that's producing the unconditional love and compassion and empathetic joy. Um, but because the Buddha brought it under the wisdom practice of Vipassana and the Four Noble Truths, they've all been infused with that light of, of wisdom, that selfless nature, that understanding of change and vulnerability and the emptiness of any separate solid self. So it's no different with the mudita. Its, it's subtlety is in fact rooted in the, the, kind of, the kind of joy that it is, selfless joy. Uh, and as one of the questions pointed out this morning, well, how can I be practicing? It feels really selfish to be practicing joy for myself in a world where there's so many people who aren't experiencing joy in a world often overcome by suffering. Very legitimate question. And then, and to learn that, well, in fact, it, its purifying and healing nature is what helps us do what's necessary to alleviate the world of the overwhelm, to teach the world that we're, that anyone, all beings are capable of accessing that wellspring of joy, selfless joy, can do it and here's how it can be done. So like the other Brahma Viharas, Mudita was also taught in the context of Vipassana, a wisdom practice that it's, it's a stepping stone to awakening or a companion along the way um, to awakening. Uh, we often mention, you know, it might be 
one of these four Ramaviharas that is your particular portal or doorway into the practice. Uh, and other ones that we find difficult, we can set aside. When we under, uh, the more we understand the Brahma Viharas, the more we, we sense that they're one heart. They're one mind. And they're just, there's just four facets of that one mind, the facet of unconditional love, the facet of the response to suffering with care and compassion, and the facet that reaches out where it sees happiness and goodness in other beings and appreciates that, celebrates that, feels joy for that, the empathetic joy, uh, or the doorway of that deep, stability and unmoving mind of equanimity that faces all things, whether sorrowful or happy, and is able to hold those opposites, that tension arc of opposites, and still be present, still be non-reactive. And right alongside, are all its sister states. Equanimity is not there in a vacuum. It doesn't leave behind kindness, compassion, and empathetic joy. They are right there. And as soon as it's one of them is called for, it steps up, either alongside the equanimity or instead of the equanimity. So it's like you know a symphony that's just playing according to the composition that tells the story. A beautiful symphony is a story. Uh, and the Brahma Viharas being played out in daily life are, are a story, are a response to what we see, hear, smell, and taste, feel in the body, know in the heart. That's how the Brahma Viharas uh, express themselves spontaneously, without force, without control. As a training, we make these safe spaces of a retreat and, and spend some time with each one individually, even though when they play out, we let go control and we don't know which one might come up or arise in pairs or all as one mind, all four of them. But we get to learn how to um, discern which is which by doing a retreat like this, where we focus for some time on one Brahma Vihara at a time. And, and that's how, how they grow in subtlety and often where we find um, ourselves for a while, um, you know, not quite knowing how to navigate, not quite knowing where we are which way to go, um, just to stop, just to stop, go back to the body, see if we can call up what we do know, maybe just that initial sense of unconditional love for ourselves, for our own body, mind, and our wish to be safe and protected to be happy and healthy and to move, navigate through the world with ease, back to that. And then come back to the murita where might be a little bit slippery and slidy at, at times. <clears throat> what is the best way to proceed? And what's the best murita uh, subject to use? In the, in the texts, they often mention using someone we know and feel very easy about and a lot of affection for who is enjoying currently a degree of happiness and well being and achievement. They just seem to be flowing along in a good space, and we feel really happy for them. They don't incite envy or jealousy. 
that that's how dear they are to us. It just delights us that they are enjoying what they're enjoying, the fulfillment of their life at this time. So that's a, that's a good place to start. And then, and to feel that, to feel that gladness, to feel that um, deep wish that they are able to continue to, to be in that place of happiness and attuned to their, their goodness and feel our goodness connecting with their goodness. And that very naturally, organically becomes empathetic joy. We feel good for them. And then we abide there, we, we abide in, we might let go the image, we might let go uh, any structure and just as the Buddha originally taught, just wordlessly abide in the energy field of unconditional empathetic joy, appreciative joy, be it. Let it saturate our body, our bones, our neuronal system. Just let it soak and completely absorb it. And then we change postures from sitting to standing or to walking or to lying down. Uh, and then we might change who we're radiating to. It might be the way Nyanaponika described one quarter and then the second quarter, the third quarter, the fourth quarter, above, uh, below, everywhere, everyone, or the, the very specific categories uh, that we also taught. Uh, dear friends and family and, and neutral beings, difficult beings, and, and all the categories of beings, humans and non-humans, animals, and so forth. You can be creative in that. D different forms often continue to inspire continuing that stream of mudita mind, the mudita dhamma. So ho however it works best, again, at any time we can return to the compassion or the metta for a while and, and then come back, see how it works then. So what looks like mudita, but might be a mis mistaken quality in the mind. Uh, the texts talk about over exuberance being a near enemy of mudita. That is a kind of frivolous or giddiness that we, that we might identify or mistake as this selfless joy. But really there's a hook in it of identification, uh, kind of a selfing of that quality of, of giddiness or over exuberance. And then just to recognize that and realize, well, maybe for a long time, that's the best we had before we knew what the selfless, empathetic joy was. And so we have understanding about that and recognize it as not the real thing. The Brahma Vihara Mudita Dhamma. And so we go back and go back and forth until we kind of get that right and find examples of, oh yeah, well, that makes me feel, um, kind of overly exuberant or a little giddy. That's what that is. And then maybe there's another feeling. Yesterday, I went to a soccer game of an eight-year-old who's my neighbor. And he, he loves for me to come and watch his games. And I love to watch them. And it gives me a lot of mudita feeling to see him run and play. You know, and they're at the age where they're not being competitive. They're being playful. They're having fun. 
and even like the other team was uh, short a couple of members. So my friend Foxy, he joined the other team for a while so that it evened out, it didn't matter. They were just having fun, kicking the ball around. And then he was goalie for a while. It was exciting and uh, I really enjoy watching him play. This is the second season. I've watched and enjoyed that. Think back and think in your lives what kind of things in nature are with other people. Michelle was reminding me of um, when I was living in Sri Lanka in 70s and 80s, uh, I would go to an elephant orphanage. And, and once I went to a part of the orphanage that just had baby elephants and they were swimming in the river. So I went in the river, river to swim with them and they just began to play with me and grab my arm and pull me under, which scared me. <laughs> I had to pull back for a while and make sure I wasn't too far from the air. I could go up and get some air. And you know, I felt they were just being playful and they knew not to harm me. It's, it gives me a lot of joy to remember that. So often when we're teaching, we say, remember a time, a place, a person or a being that brought you this, kind of, um, this selfless joy, this completely free flowing quality of subtle joy. Um, the elephants seem to have followed throughout my life for the last 17 years, the place where we teach uh, a retreat uh, on a lake, a floating bungalow retreat in a 160 million year old tropical rainforest. The elephants have been around the entire time and we can hear them trumpet sometimes or we see their signs and so forth. But it's, it took like 15 years before we had actual contact. So a few years ago, they just started coming down to where our retreat is. And for the last several years, they just hang out next to our retreat. And we can hear them splashing water or see them. Uh, uh, they go from the bank and plunge into the water. It's a huge, plop you know of and sound of water and if your cabin is floating on the other side of the lake of the lake you feel the wave you feel the response of that and they're they're such gentle creatures you know although they, they say that the most dangerous things in the forest are falling tree or elephants but but all these years they've come to trust us as being harmless and maybe have felt the Brahma Viharas that we've been, we've been radiating um, because they just recently had the fifth or sixth calf in the last four years, right in, right in the area where our retreat center is on the land. We're not on the land. We never go on the land. The land is run by the forestry and another department runs the, the, the lake. So we're always on the lake in our floating bungalows or on the walkways. Uh, the place where we eat and the place where we meditate are also floating. Everything is floating. Uh, but we can kayak around and kayak pretty close to where the elephants are. So it's a safe feeling and it's a really good feeling especially when we, you know, when they come up and they present like they've had a new baby, a calf. And recently it was a, you know, last year it was a baby girl, this year it was a baby boy. And it's like they're showing off their baby <laughs> to our, our team. It's a Thai family who run the raft house, but uh, a group of us from the West who organize the retreats. So that brings me a lot of joy to just hear of that and to know that. Thinking of nature, you know, anything in nature that brings that kind of um, delight and happiness or 
flowers in your garden, especially at the time where they're blooming and, and you kind of reflect that you planted them and you nurtured them, watered them and, and, and saw to their well-being. And all of a sudden, it's like they're smiling at you. They, they open up. I think I mentioned before, this, uh, this, this family we help in the village near where we teach at Upper Burma, uh, who I met, she's working as a construction person carrying on her head, you know, a, a, like a cauldron with 50 pounds of bricks. And, and gradually we got to, to know this family and now um, Michelle and Jesse, and the Davis family, myself, over the years, we've, we've helped them out little by little. It, it, and it began, the results of helping them out were just little gestures that, you know, where we're trying to get them trained in the traditional arts of that village, which were weaving and, uh, uh, you know, the, the pay for a construction worker was like 28 cents a day. That didn't go very far. So very slowly and very gradually and a kind of in a way that fit in with how the village works and these poor people standing in the village, they, they had a good standing because the nature of this young woman was so delightful that she was well loved by everyone. So one year I came and for the very first time in like five years, there were, there were flowers in her mother's garden. I never had even seen anything planted there before. And each year it grew from flowers to vegetables and it just began to flourish from that one little gesture. And today, you know, they have, she's married with three children. Um, they take care of her mother who's nearby in a, a bamboo hut. Uh, and the results of the, the gesture of the heart, taking joy in someone's being and their goodness and, and the expression of that, that you know, it just starts with seen a few flowers and ends up where, you know, they have jobs, they have a home, they have a means of living and taking care of the kids and sending them to school. When I met her, she had left school at third grade to go to work. And that's what most village kids in Burma in a village like that have to do. Uh, so that led to us building a school and raising the funds so that every child in that village can go to school. No one left out. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do now, even through all the hardship that's happened there. We're, we're still trying to get funds through uh, to support the school and the teachers and the uniforms and all the things that the kids need. So the smallest, subtlest little gesture of metta or compassion or or appreciate, appreciative joy, you know, it just has results that we can't, we don't know. We can't imagine the outcome, but, and, and we shouldn't, we should let go of any attachment to the results, but we can have faith that that gesture will result in goodness, though we don't know what. So I like to think of these, Brahma Viharas, including the Mudita Brahma Vihara Dhamma, as the, the, the subtle energy waves or vibrations um, that result in the, in the intimate touching of our goodness with another's goodness. In however it's expressed in thoughts, in speech, or in actions. Uh, and and that, that subtlety of that vibration is why we may not recognize it and, and why it might be hard to practice at first. We weren't taught it in our own cultures. 
But then in time, once we have a felt sense of it, we, we see that it's, we can ex access it and it can influence how we see things and feel things and hear things um, and, and everything we do from the little bit of mentoring that we can do by kindnesses to people we can help or to children, you know, just delighting in things that they do. Uh, think of those who have mentored you. Maybe it was a teacher in grade school or high school uh, or a spiritual teacher. Um, someone from whom you felt seen, recognized, you know, acknowledged, accepted kind of unconditionally. Reflect on that a gift. Where, where would that be coming from? You know, which Brahma Vihara or which ones would that be coming from? Their, their kindness of metta, their compassion, where they saw where they can uh, help you in a direction or in a certain area, or they're just selfless joy in your being, and it's sort of karmically unexplainable. We all have them, and we all have the opportunity to do the same to be a mentor to others. They may not even know it. So some of my mentors, I didn't know until later that I was being mentored by them. You know, others are more obvious. My teachers like Paul Reps, and Hannah Viri, my first spiritual teacher, a Hawaiian kahuna woman from Molokai who lived on this island. Um, an, another woman in California who I met when she was 90. She was like a mystic. And I was her student for the rest of her life till 97 when she passed away. At that time, I was just really interested in the spiritual life. I didn't think about their gifts. I didn't, I didn't understand about mentoring or, you know, mudita or any of those things, but I was absorbing, absorbing something because they still are very alive in my heart. And I feel that strength and that um, guidance is there. And I feel like always finding ways to give back. Um, it, and some texts that my friend Jake Davis, who you, many of you know, translated um, the Buddhist monk, German, I think as well, Nyana Moli, said that those imbued with mudita are glad that the, the, the mudita is itself selfless gladness. And that being of gladness is recognized by others and recognized in others. Gladness is characterized um, as a gladdening energy vibration when we're interested in others' success, others' uplifting others' well-being. Manifest as the elimination, elimination uh, of aversion, which is one of the translations for the far enemy of mudita. And the, the proximate cause for mudita to arise is seeing other beings' accomplishments, fulfillments, success. We, we see that, and what's the heart's natural response? 
we can easily relate that to compassion. When we see another being's hurt or pain or suffering, what's the natural organic response of the heart? To care, to want to help, to want to alleviate. So the far enemy, far enemies are listed usually as envy and jealousy, uh, and which are similar. They, they both mean that someone has something that we want. Jealousy is said to perhaps have a little more negativity than the envy, which is why, as I mentioned earlier, often we use the word envy as a compliment. Oh, I envy you, you know? You, you won all your races, or you got all good grades. Um, but in its not so good sense, it's when we, we have a deep covetousness of other people's lives, our success, our objects that we wish we had. And so to, to recognize that as for what they are is really important to understand how envy and jealousy work in the mind and how they can work um, without being seen in the shadows. How, you know, we don't really know what's going on. Even boredom sometimes is a definition in the Pali texts of the aversion of envy and jealousy, the opposite of murita. Uh, very interesting, it causes me to pause and look more at the bored mind. Michelle mentioned in her talk about um, Barry and Anne Ustinov, who wrote Cinderella and her sisters about envy and jealousy. Uh, some decades ago, uh, I was working with a mentor in Chicago who, who from whom I learned about their book and the work on envy and jealousy, which talks about how it's, it's based on not being able to connect with our own goodness. And therefore we seek or covet the goodness of others or vice versa. Others who are disconnected from their own goodness see goodness in us and covet that goodness in us. Um, it can be hard to know we're doing that and even harder to know when it's being done to us. So all, those, all those years ago, when I began, when we began to study and learn about this, I was at a very long retreat. We were at a long retreat with Upandita and I started to feel uh, kind of sick. Kind of, I, I, bet, I started to feel all this weird energy in my body, in my heart, like um, it's really hard to explain. It's painful, and it was. It made me sad. It made me feel heavy. It made me feel. Um, afraid uh, and so I just I just had to sit through that um, and at a certain point in the retreat someone at that retreat had to leave and after they left I felt really good again <laughs> I felt happy 
and I, the rest of my retreat was buoyant and joyful, filled with mudita. I think I actually had been practicing the mudita at, with Upandita at that time. And, and later on, because the friend who left was a good friend, we spoke and I, I, I mentioned how I felt. And because of the closeness of our friendship, he acknowledged that he felt envious and jealous. And I said, well, well, well why? And he said, because I, I, I seem to practice so much. Every time he'd come up and pass my room late at night, he'd see the light on, you know, under the door. And I said to him, you know, I'd often fall asleep with the light on. <laughs> so at least part of that was based on, you know, a misperception. But it just allowed us to talk freely about those emotions and learn how, how strongly affected we can be. And if we look in our own life, when, when, when you feel someone's energy affecting you, in such a way where you feel a heaviness or a, a weightiness or a intrusiveness of some sort, um, you might know what it is. Or if you're close enough with a person, you might bring it out, right? Open it up. When we understand that it's about a disconnect from our goodness and that when we're disconnected from our goodness, it's likely to be replaced by shame and unworthiness, or not good, or not good enough. That's what the Yulanov couple ultimately said. But the, the, the basis of envy and jealousy is, is shame. If we're not in touch with that goodness, then we're gonna feel a, a deep unworthiness. And that will influence our life. That will influence how we live, think, and speak, and act. Think about that. <clears throat> think about how true that is in your life. I had something I was going to close with. You like that? To appreciate the growing subtlety from of these energy vibrations, Brahma Vihara, all of which are subtle. It's not like metta is, is grosser than compassion. They're, they're all quite refined and subtle. It, it's just that their, their energy level can, can be slightly more subtle as it moves through needing greater wisdom. So we need a greater wisdom to be with pain or suffering than just wishing for the welfare of all beings. And then we need a greater subtler energy vibration to be able to celebrate others' success without being envious or jealous, something we didn't, weren't taught to do in the first place. And so when you hear us open up with the equanimity, you understand why that has the most wisdom and why that's the most important. So just to hold all of these, all of these in perspective and appreciate why we're moving through them in, in the way we do. But also, as Michelle said earlier today, it's perfectly fine to, 
to, to move through them kind of spontaneously back and forth or in pairs or is that one mind of Brahman, one Brahma Vihara heart? This is a, a poem by Dick Allen, born in 1939. Listening deeply. Listening deeply, sometimes in another, you can hear the sound of a hermit sighing as he climbs a mountain trail to reach a waterfall or a Buddhist nun reciting prayers while moonlight falls through the window onto an old clay floor. And once in a while, a child rolling a hoop through the alleyways of Tokyo laughing or a farmer pausing in a rice field to watch geese fly, the thoughts on his lips he doesn't think to say. I'll read that once more. Listening deeply, sometimes in another, you can hear the sound of a hermit sighing as he climbs a mountain trail to reach a waterfall, or a Buddhist nun reciting prayers while moonlight falls through the window onto an old clay floor. And once in a while, a child rolling a hoop through the alleyways of Tokyo, laughing, or a farmer pausing in a rice field to watch geese fly, the thoughts on his lips he doesn't think to say. the original sound on. <laughs> Much mudita. Thank you, everybody. Good to see you Sunday beings. And um, we'll see you for the Metta chant choir in an hour, everyone else. So be well.